Welcome everybody. Uh, great to see you all. Thank you very much for joining us. My name's uh, Nick Wilton. I'm uh, an Associate Dean in the Business School. My responsibilities are for, for professional education and accreditation in Oxford Brooks Business School. Um, and in, as I always say, in a previous life, I was uh, uh, a lecturer in human resource management and my research has historically been in uh, the sociology of work and employment and labour markets. Um, so uh, thank you very much for joining. This is, this is officially tagged as an alumni session, but as I can see, lots of colleagues from across the business school, both professional service and academic colleagues, also some current students and some alumni, I think it would probably be better referred to this as a kind of community webinar. Um, so I'm going to be talking today a little bit about work and employment in the post-pandemic period, um, and I'll come to that in a second. But this series of uh, seminars or webinars rather um, for alumni and colleagues from across the university and so on is we've taken the approach of taking something that is kind of newsworthy um, that is a kind of contemporary issue and then try to scratch the surface and see what's what's really going on so we've got sessions uh, we've got sessions in a couple of weeks time about unionism trade unionism so it's a great time to be studying industrial relations at the moment uh, and unions to find out what's happening there and also around personal branding as well um, in in uh, a couple of months time or about six weeks time um, so hopefully you'll find what I'm going to talk about interesting um, and and so on so I'm going to share my screen um, I won't be able to see anything in the chat but if anyone does have any comments or uh, any questions and so on we can either pick those up at the end or if you've got any burning issues as I go through uh, then um, please do do shout. I'm trying to make this as, as interactive as possible. Okay, so um, so I've called my to a presentation, The Great Resignation, Quiet Quitting and a Good Enough Job. Um, and I'm slightly kicking myself by calling this what's really happening in the world of the work post-pandemic. I wish I'd left out the really because it suggests that I'm going to come to some definitive conclusions about what's happening in the labour market. And given all of the turbulence of the last few years, and indeed even in the last few months and weeks um, uh, in the context of the cost of living crisis um, and so on, then the labour market has probably experienced a period of turbulence that it hasn't for some years. So actually, what really is the kind of theme, really, of what I'm going to be talking about is the fact that actually it's very difficult to know what's really happening. But we'll start by firstly talking about some long-term trends in employment, trying to put what's happening in the last few years into some kind of broader sort of context about the position in work of work in society, about um, um, some of the kind of broader trends in particular around quality of working life and work intensification and so on, and then look at some of the kind of contemporary labour market trends. So we will look at the Great Resignation, this idea um, of, a, of a wholesale mass exodus from the workplace or from employers and so on look at the idea of quite quitting as a, as, a, um, uh, as a trend, and also the extent to which these kind of trends amount to something more substantial. Then we'll look at what employers are doing in response, and again, a complex pattern of, of employer responses and so on. And then very briefly, and literally in the last slide, talk about what the significance of all of this might be for HR um, as, a, as a discipline, uh, an academic discipline, but more importantly, as a as an area of management practice. So some big ideas to put all of this in kind of context and to, to assess what's been happening during the pandemic and post pandemic. So over the last few decades, certainly since the 1980s, that there's been a kind of a, a recognition of the, 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 the idea of work has fundamentally changed in lots of ways. And whilst work has always been a source of identity for people and, and certainly in terms of kind of profession and occupation and so on, that the idea of work as a source of fulfillment, of meaning, and indeed as a source of community has um, taken on a, 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 a greater significance, particularly in the face of uh, the decline of traditional sources of social cohesion, be those organized religion, be they um, communities around workplaces rather than the idea of work itself. And so quite often, we we'll talk about work or work is talked about in the context of these sort of quasi religious notions of sacrifice and salvation or indeed love through work. And the, the, the kind of use of the language of personal relationships in HRM has really taken off since the, the 1980s and 1990s in particular. So ideas around commitment and loyalty 
um, and, and so on become the language of management, not simply the language of, of kind of personal relationships and so on. So that's one particular part of the context, this sort of shift in how we talk about and think about work. And that has particular significance, I think, in the context of the way in which work is, has been perceived during the pandemic and in the post-pandemic period. In a turn of macroeconomic kind of perspective, we take a perspective about labour markets as a whole, particularly in the UK, what we see uh, emerging over the last three or four decades is a kind of what, what's referred to as an hourglass labour market where you have lots of, you know, relatively what traditionally referred to as good jobs, good prospects, good pay, opportunities for development, opportunities for progression, um, good terms and conditions, and so on. You have lots of those sorts of jobs being created. And in particular, we've seen that along the, the increase in um, uh, the notion of graduate jobs and the expanse of, of university, the expansion of universities in order to fulfill this growing number of of good jobs which are associated with the application of knowledge and expertise um, rather than um, kind of um, uh, skilled work or kind of menial work. And then you've also seen this sort of expansion of bad jobs um, put, put broadly. And again, that's partly associated with jobs which have poor terms and conditions of employment, relatively poor pay, um, poor opportunities for development and so on. And a critical perspective on all of this, a kind of critical HR, critical sociological perspective on this, sees both of these situations as opportunities for exploitation by employers. So on the one hand, this idea of exploitation by positive HRM practices. So we'll come back to in a minute this idea of tech firms and the types of HR practice that they've historically enacted, these, this extreme uh, sort of um, kind of employment relationships, if you like, whereby people commit themselves wholesale to an employer and, uh, are, 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 and they're kind of their, what's referred to perhaps not in the best use of language, but referred to as willing slaves. Um, this idea that people are, people's effort, their discretionary effort, their time and so on can be almost bought wholesale by um, extreme pay packages, extreme terms and conditions, extreme uh, workplaces and so on. So that's one form of exploitation. The other form of exploitation is more straightforward insofar as in the absence of regulation and unionism and so on, we've seen the expansion of the gig economy, use of zero hours contracts as the, 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 the ultimate kind of conclusion of this growth in flexible employment, which typically is in favour of employers rather than employees. And so overall, we've seen this kind of long term kind of move uh, trend on a number of different indices towards a decline in the quality of working life. So this is something that's been seen since, as I say, since the 1980s in particular, a change in the way we view work, but also a change in the kind of the, the environment of work uh, in terms of the labour market experience of different employees and employee groups, all of which add up to on a number of different matrices at a generalised level to a decline in quality of working life. And I'll come back to one particular measure in a second. But when it's often interesting when putting these types of speak sort of uh, and talks or lectures and those sorts of things together, things often pop up in the news, which are always a bit handy about to actually demonstrate a particular point. So this was taken from The Guardian yesterday. You may have come across it on, in The Guardian or other news source, no sources. Criticism of a school which was advertising a deputy head role. And I, I, I sort of hesitated to use in my previous slide this word about the language about, about love within the context of work. But then something like this pops up and talks about the idea of people being wedded to their roles, um, talks about the importance of sacrifice um, and so on. Uh, so some of the language in this is, as it says in the caption, that uh, some people thought this was a spoof because the language is so extreme in terms of outlining the particular expectations of the role. So that, that it talks about that the role may dominate your life on occasions. That, that we cannot carry anyone. We need a commitment to stay until the job is done, to lead with bravery. It's a very emotive language, which speaks to this idea that, 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 that work in some way is first and foremost in people's lives. So that's a recent example, but that's something that we've seen kind of wrapped up over the course of the, the last few decades. So in terms of specific context, before we come to the, the, the pandemic, one particular measure of the quality of working life is this idea of work intensity. Um, and successive studies by the Resolution Foundation in particular, 
and, and Francis Green, a work sociologist, has, has suggested that what well, has found under over conclusive studies over the sort of longer term um, uh, or consecutive studies over the longer term that work intensity continues to increase and has been increasing since the 1990s. So that's in terms of the requirement that people work very hard, that they work to tight deadlines, that they work at very high speed for a high proportion of their time, that, that they work under a great deal of tension. So all of these types of, of, of measures of work intensity have been gradually increased since the 90s. Um, and not only at the top. So when I talked about good jobs, this idea of workers in the top quarter of earners said so they worked under a great deal of tension, and often that's historically been the case, but that's increasingly the case even amongst those workers. But also importantly, the same was true of half of those in the bottom quarter, that they, they work under a great deal of tension. And that, that is a significant new trend, that people that are relatively low earners are working under greater and greater pressure. And again, we can attribute that to kind of labour market trends in terms of gig economy and those sorts of things. If you think about Amazon workers, delivery drivers, uh, warehouse workers and so on. And one of the, the things that this has been attributed to, uh, and again, this is borne out by the evidence, is that there's been a shift from personal discretion to a customer orientation as the key driver of work intensity. So this shift that, that people had, well, I used to work really hard because I chose to. That was my, my I'll put in the, the, the hours, I'm ambitious, I'll work hard in order to, to get ahead. But increasingly people are reporting that the driver of, of work intensity or greater work intensity is customer orientation. And that, if you think about um, organizational competency frameworks and so on, customer or client orientation are increasingly seen as, as key attributes of employees. And in the public sector, we've obviously seen growth in things like league tables and metrics in higher education and education and healthcare and so on, and this greater performance management of the workforce collectively, which is focused on the measurement of performance, partly in response to customer demands. And obviously, unsurprisingly this idea of working with high intensity working hard working long hours all of those sorts of things increases the likelihood of people reporting stress and depression and burnout and so on so that's the kind of broad context and that takes us up to 2020 and so on and then this all happens so the pandemic hits and these long-run trends come up against something of a rupture both socially economically and so on. And so people's experience of the pandemic obviously is, is significantly different. So we have the emptying of offices in certain types of workplaces. We have people often in, a, in quite a privileged position to be able to work at home in relative comfort and be able to carry on their work, um, working remotely, working from home um, and so on. But we also have obviously workers, typically those on the front line of the pandemic response. So healthcare workers, um, uh, other essential workers and so on that had to carry, under, carry, carry on working, but under increasing duress for all sorts of different reasons. So you have different experience of the pandemic, and, but in the context of this kind of broad long, long run trend in terms of work intensification and so on. So the question is, and I suppose the purpose of the whole pre sort of presentation is still about, well, what happened next? What were the results of this kind of you know, what happened when these long run trends and our attitudes to work and our experience of work and employment, what happens when they when they come up against something which is a which is a fundamental rupture. So we've got ideas that, that pop up and that become very newsworthy and they become newsworthy across or they become social media worthy as well and so on. Some of which have their origins in evidence, other which others that have their origins in um, well, less evidence, basically. So we start with the Great Resignation. So many of you will, I'm sure, have come across this term over the last couple of years um, that was referred to the Great Resignation as this once in a great generation, take this job and shove it moment. So, so the Great Resignation was the term coined by a uh, professor of management at UCL um, in mid 2021. Um, and refer to this idea that there was a kind of mass exodus, both from employment generally, i.e. lots of people leaving the labour market um, as a consequence of the pandemic or in response to the pandemic, or indeed leaving their jobs, um, moving employers, moving jobs, changing occupations, 
um, taking, taking different career routes and so on. And so in the US, for example, Harvard Business Review, Business Review reported that, that mid-career employees in the tech and healthcare, healthcare industries were most likely to be um, uh, to taking part in this big exodus. Um, and so on. in the UK, in particular, we have this sort of same pattern, if you like, in the healthcare sector, hospitality, education. And of course, in healthcare, particularly on the front line, it's inevitable that people that went through an incredibly often traumatic experience of employment decided to, to move to something else or move employers. And indeed, in the hospitality sector, the decline in opportunities in the hospitality sector as a result of lockdown and those sorts of things and, and the closure of employee, uh, employers and those sorts of things all led to significant changes in patterns of departure from either the labour market or the jobs. And the great resignation, the evidence suggests that, that yes, there was a pattern of exodus. So the CIPD reported that between April and June, so at the time when this idea was being coined, 3.2% 3, 3 of the UK working population made a job to job move, a record high. So that's not including uh, those people that left the labour market. So on a working population of about 30 million people in the UK, we're talking about a million people shifted jobs during in that three month period. And more recent evidence from the CIPD suggests that, yeah, the hard to fill vacancies still persist in many public services. So there's been particular patterns, particularly out of public services. So education, healthcare, most notably, um, because opportunities might be better elsewhere or the experience of work during the pandemic was such that, that uh, um, there was a, a desire to move on. And then we also see the fact that the intention to quit was also remained relatively high, particularly during 2022, 43% of employed people surveyed said they were somewhat likely or extremely likely to consider changing jobs. So we've got a some evidence of a, of a shift, a, a, a response to the pandemic at a collective level, which amounts to something significant. For those remaining in employment, indeed remaining in jobs, there's also this idea of quiet quitting, um, which again, is something that you may have come across. And in a way, so I suggest this might be a new frontier in employment engagement, but ultimately the idea of working to rule or working to contract has always existed, whether individually or collectively. Is a form of resistance to, to certain conditions in work that people would say, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to do what's absolutely necessary. I'm not going to push myself and so on. So this act of not going above and beyond at work and just meeting the requirements of their job description, um, this idea of quiet quitting. Um, and this gained a lot of traction on social media and this idea of quiet quitting was, 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 was everywhere, if you like, and lots of people claiming to be quiet quitters. And indeed, some of the evidence suggests, yeah, there is something to this, that quiet quitters make up at least 50% of the US workforce, probably more. One in three UK workers label themselves quiet quitters and so on. But in particular, but particularly in the context of the things that I talked about a second ago in terms of um, work intensification and so on, this idea of quiet quitting is, a, is, a, is an affront to the idea of employer enge employee engagement. And, um, there's a strong focus amongst employers to, to heighten levels of engagement, to unlock discretionary effort, to unlock the types of behaviours that, 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 that people can um, uh, hold back in employment and that can um, be the difference between high performance and moderate performance and indeed high levels of customer or client satisfaction and low levels of client and customer satisfaction. So there's a real challenge there, I think, for employers in the sense that, well, quiet quitting might be a kind of transient term and so on, but if it's suggestive of a, of a bigger trend in terms of employee engagement, then clearly that's something for employers to, 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 to argue about, or to be concerned about, rather. However, obviously, there is a question to be asked about whether is quiet quitting the problem for employers, or is it simply the consequence of an expectation of employees that staff Ever, ever increasingly go above and beyond the, the specific uh, contractual um, requirements of their role. That this, this, this requirement to increase levels of effort above, um, constantly over time in order to, to perform well, is that the real problem? So I think that's a, a question that, that, that needs asking. Um, so we've got two trends. Great resignation, we've got this idea of quiet quitting and so on, and then some substance to these. 
And if you start looking at the kind of popular kind of management texts and so on, and, and uh, these are books that were published in the last year or so, and of course, there's going to be, you know, people look for interesting things to write about in a, in a period and lots of people get paid a lot of money for proclaiming the new and that things are suddenly different and we need a new way of thinking about things or doing things or managing things. Um, and, uh, but is there something to this? So these three books, for example, I talked about this idea about love at work and um, commitment, not love in the workplace, but about loving your work and that idea that, you know, if you um, love your job, you'll never work a day in your life and all of these sorts of things. And this idea of commitment, uh, sacrifice and um, salvation through work and, and so on. And so we have books on that work won't love you back that actually this is a, a one-way street in the employment relationship, that no matter how much you give of your, um, yourself to your job, you'll always be in an imbalanced relationship with your employer and with your work. And that how devotion to our jobs keeps us exploited alone and exhausted. And then we have this idea of making light work about actually let's slightly more seriously look at the idea of work and what it's doing to us collectively and individually in terms of our health and in terms of um, uh, our experience of life beyond work and let's make some changes and then this idea of the good enough job related to this idea of quiet quitting that that essentially let's stop pursuing the perfect job the dream job that's always just out of reach that next promotion um, and so on and let's find jobs that are just good enough to, in order to be able to allow them to fulfill our um, to, to fulfill the type of life that we want that is constantly striving for better um, typically higher paid employment and so on is not necessarily the way to to satisfaction and so on so the question is is well whether well, is this a bigger movement is this something that's that 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 that, that there is a whilst the trends the evidence is sketchy a little bit but it's certainly something there has the pandemic shifted our, our kind of collective view about what it is to work and, and, the, and the role it has in the rest of our lives and so on have we re-evaluated things? So is this, the pandemic, really a kind of watershed moment in work and employment? And that people are responding to the experience of going through a collectively traumatic experience. And for some people, particularly traumatic, having lost loved ones and seeing people suffer and so on. Are people re-evaluating um, what's important? and re-evaluating the, the value of corporate life and the promises of corporate life and all of the things that, that work um, uh, tends to promise when we're looking for jobs and employers are trying to sell themselves and the value propositions they offer and all of those sorts of things. And are we also seeing a rebalance in the employment relationship? If people are um, perhaps caring less about the work they do, the jobs they hold and maintaining those jobs and moving for the next promotion, does it free us to a certain extent from um, that, that constant expectation to work harder, to give more of ourselves to work, to give more hours, to give more effort, to push ourselves and so on? And does that fundamentally rebalance to a certain extent the employment relationship? Um, so are we moving to a slightly different nature of the employment relationship? And there is some evidence of some of this. So again, so only today there's a, um, story across the media about the fact that this trial that's gone going at the moment for a four-day week that the vast majority of employers that are involved in the trial of the four-day week have chosen to extend the trial to the next period that actually it's leading to more productivity healthier workers and so on and therefore look at that so is it time for a four-day week and the quote there is from an ft article from uh, a few weeks ago talking about work intensification and basically saying if we can't work less hard perhaps we should just work less so if the work won't change, perhaps our time dedicated to it should. Um, but there's a big question, obviously, that, that, that about whether current trends in your significant. And obviously, I've not really mentioned some of the kind of the big stuff that's happening at the moment around the cost of living crisis, um, and the, the um, industrial action that is ongoing, uh, this, this sort of period of, in recent times, relatively unprecedented uh, sort of industrial unrest. Um, and so on, but also some of the other things that have impacted on people's experience of work and the economy recently, things like Brexit and the fact that we have reduced inward immigration because of Brexit. We have uh, tighter labour market conditions. We have 
um, all the withdrawal from employment from people that are uh, were unwell or chose to retire early and so on. And then obviously we've got this spike of inflation that's put an upward pressure on wages and therefore, you know, significant kind of, um, and all of that shifts the balance of, of power within the employment relationship. If you have less workers, you have high inflation, employers, some are responding by increasing wages and so on. So it's all of those sorts of things are kind of thrown into the mix as well to see actually, well, is the pandemic responsible for some shift? And when it comes to this idea of the great resignation, CIPD are very skeptical. So CIPD are, are quite useful because they do regular kind of labour market studies. And one of the challenges of looking at the most recent period is that there's not an awful lot of hard data to go on, but the CIPD do provi provide some useful data to, to assess actually what is the evidence of the great resignation. And they're very skeptical of I this idea and suggest actually the great resignation was uh, inevitable after the, the pandemic. It wasn't really necessarily a response to, to changing attitudes to work and employment and a re-evaluation of what's important in people's lives. Rather, it was a response to what they call the great suppression, that actually the pandemic meant that no one was moving job, that actually that, that lots of people were in furlough and so on. And so the kind of the dynamics of furlough ending and the economy reopening and so on led to this sort of pent up demand for people to move and do different things. So even now, perhaps the great resignation is quite, not quite as significant as significant as we, we, we as we, as as first appears, and so on. And so, actually, quite a lot of what we're seeing at the moment is the type of labour market dynamics that we would expect to see in a period post as a pandemic as a proxy for a recession. That actually, that the, the, the post pandemic period is what we might anticipate it as seeing rather than some shift in attitudes that are suddenly seeing people actually re-evaluating what's important and changing our orientation to work more generally. So as a, obviously part of the, the response to the pandemic is employees and the way they feel about their work and their sort of job moving behaviors and those sorts of things. But there's also, you know, interesting stuff going on as far as employer um, uh, responses to the post-pandemic period, but also wrapped up, as I say, within the kind of broader context about kind of us, you know, skirting the boundaries of recession, about um, uh, the impact of the ongoing impact of things like Brexit and all of those sorts of things, which all tend to mix up and create certain patterns of behaviour. But what we're really seeing in terms of employer response is lots of kind of contradictory behaviour. Um, most obviously in the last couple of points, which is around remote working and about, um, uh, about, about um, employees' willingness to allow people to continue working remotely and the call back to the office. And I'll come to that in a second. But in terms of employer responses, then some employers over the recent sort of six months to a year are responding by so certainly the kind of recessionary pressures at the moment and the fact that there's been significant layoffs in certain parts of the, the, the sector, particularly the tech sector. So there's been layoffs and tougher performance, tougher, tougher performance management arrangements amid economic uncertainty. So there's lots of stuff written in the tech sector about effectively um, uh, organizations spring cleaning and actually laying off unprecedented amounts of workers over recent, uh, recent months um, and indeed the last 12 months. In other parts, organisations are reducing extreme perks, the types of perks, as I say, that are associated with, they started off with big blue chip firms like IBM in the 19, uh, 1980s and now find their kind of less manifestation in the types of office and working environments that you have at Google and Meta um, and those sorts of organisations. And so that headline there is taken from a, a recent article, pay for your own massage, how the era of extreme office perks came to an end in light of the fact that Google has just fired 31 of its, uh, its uh, mass, ma masseurs for its employees. So we see that, but in other parts of the economy, um, again, using the CRP evidence, we're seeing actually employers are, are responding by raising pay, increasing duties of staff, so further intensifying work, and indeed upskilling workers, which we'd expect to see in a kind of, in, in a period of um, significant labor shortage. And then, as I say, we've got this big trend, I think, that's, that's still unresolved, 
that started with the pandemic around the increase in remote working um, and this idea of productivity paranoia that employers and managers struggle with the idea of home working and remote working because of this, this perception that employees are not working uh, hard enough and that actually um, home working is some way easier, um, which I think probably for at least some of us is not necessarily the lived experience. But again, even that is not necessarily um, cut and dried with employers you know, uh, responding in the same way. So we've got sort of a recent uh, statement by the, the head of the CBI, Confederation of British Industry, saying most bosses secretly want all staff back in the office. And there's an unspoken thing about organisations that actually we don't trust you after all to do your work if you're working remotely. So there's one pressure to get everyone back into the office. And we've seen a bit of that with the government as well. And on the other hand, we've got some organisations saying, actually, maybe we do need to move on. And so HSBC, for example, consulting staff for whether to keep its global headquarters in Canary Wharf, where it's been for the last three decades. So again, complex patterns, contradictory patterns of employee uh, performance. And just a couple of views on this that, that I came across. On the right hand side, you'll see that, that the somewhat infamous note that Jacob Rees-Mogg left on the the desks of civil servants, um, I can't remember how long ago, 18 months ago, when he was briefly, and probably the only ever, Minister for Brexit Opportunities and Government Efficiencies, when he left this very passive aggressive note on people's desks when they were working from home. Um, sorry, you are right when I visited, I look forward to seeing you in the office very soon. Um, I'm pretty certainly didn't mean the every good wishes bit. Um, and then you also have other perspectives and probably a perspective that uh, uh, a lot of people heard. So a tweet, my boss was like, people working from home are just pretending to work. And it's like, what do you think I'm doing in the office? So is there any real fundamental difference between working at home and working in the office? Um, so if you take the employer kind of trends and those sorts of things, and we take the, the, the employer perspective, maybe we are moving towards a situation where Google offices are gonna be empty you know, that, that actually the extreme perks that, that companies like Google have historically offered and that put pressure on other organizations to offer similar high levels of perks and that are, are not quite explicitly, but at least implicitly there to keep people in work, to keep people productive. You know, this great food and company gyms and masseurs and climbing walls and cycling tracks and offices and all of these sorts of things. They are there not for the, the benefit of workers necessarily, but rather for the um, um, uh, benefit of the organization. And so there is a view that actually what we're seeing are two signs of the same trends. We're seeing a reevaluation on the employee side saying, well, actually what's, what's valuable to me is, as in the first quote, working remotely, going home on time, allowing me time and space to do all the things that I'm interested in doing outside of work but also employers deciding actually all of this stuff isn't necessarily um, what we should be spending our money on. And perhaps we need to move to a slightly different approach to employee. So these two quotes are taken, in a, are taken from a, an article looking at uh, the reduction in perks from tech workers um, and actually employers and employees looking at what's important from their perspective whether it's investment in all of these extreme perks and whether the extreme perks are what employees want after all. And so finally, um, what do we make of this from a HR standpoint? What does it all add up to? Um, and it's very difficult to say from the point of view of both the employee side, the kind of supply side, labour market trends, great resignation and so on. And indeed from the employer side as well. So I think the pandemic, as in lots of areas of life, has shifted things. There has been something of a rupture in terms of the, the way people perceive work and so on, whether it amounts to quite the, the new era, the watershed moment, the, the rupture with the past that, that some have proclaimed and this shift towards a, a different perspective on work is, is obviously to be, um, to be debated. But there is perhaps some challenge to what might be considered now orthodox models of human resource management, particularly best practice or high commitment HRM, that 
firms, if they were wealthy enough, could buy the, the time, the commitment, the engagement of their workforce through offering um, particular types of perks and particular types of packages and so on. That in a sense, they could be, they could be paid to put work first. So there might be some challenge to that idea um, because obviously this idea of willing slaves, as I said, it's not the most sort of, you know, it's a bit of an unsavory term, but it's a useful term in the sense of identifying, you know, suggesting that people, well, okay, I'm gonna sacrifice myself. I'm gonna give up everything else in my life in order to commit myself to becoming a, a Google worker or a, a meta worker or whatever. But it relies on a degree of willingness to be bought. Um, and so if that changes, as in those previous two quotes, and that people actually think, well, yes, I want to continue working and earning good money and all those sorts of things, but I want to give up everything. And there's even a generational dimension to this as well that might be at play. So when employers and employees no longer see the value in offering such perks, does it require a different type of HRM, different approach, different, different, different ideas? And this is where it comes back to an idea that some of you may have come across about Kind of common good HRM. That whilst best practice HRM often leads to nice things and high pay and good opportunities of development and so on, is there something else that HRM should be doing? Should it have a, a greater social purpose, enabling people to, to have a be better experience both in work and also out of work? Um, and so on. And so is it time um, for a kind of human centered HRM rather than one which is focused on? work itself so the whole human both as a as a person as a public and a private individual and hrm practices which help people you know self-actualize if we use the idea of of, uh, of maslow to um to become whole human beings rather than just a whole workers as such so um i think that's from me um i see if there is anything in the chat um, uh, yeah, thank you, Carla. Yeah, the, co the comments in the chat just noticed that about four day working week. Yeah, I, I see that's really interesting. Again, one of those things that's really timely in the context of talking about these sorts of things. And actually, perhaps that is a slightly more significant trend than perhaps some of the things that are, have been flagged here around quiet quitting and so on, because it speaks to both the employer priorities around productivity and so on but also the employee priorities so it will be really really interesting to see how that plays out going forward um, uh, and so on and whether in the same way um, that, that employers can't quite seem to get a handle on how to respond to the demand for remote working and so on whether that will also be the case with lots of employees in terms of this idea of four day working as well and imagine the same response that some employers will say okay that seems to make sense, we'll, we'll, we'll go for it. And others will be very, very hesitant, again, around this idea of what might be called kind of productivity paranoia. But if the evidence is there, I can see it really uh, um, uh, being quite a significant development. Um, uh, thanks, Janaid. So how do you see AI playing a, a part in HRM in the future of work? Again, that's I think that's that's something that again has been been sort of in the news in the last few weeks, hasn't it? And this idea of of uh, um, almost the next kind of um, uh, significant wave of what well, you might want to call it a kind of an, another industrial revolution in the sense of AI fundamentally shaping the, the 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 experience of work increasingly for professional workers or knowledge based workers as a, a shift. And I remember. Um, uh, having those sorts of discussions quite some years ago about this sort of the migration of those sorts of jobs to to different parts of the world and so on and AI being a big threat now to those types of work so it will be again very difficult to say I think there's lots of people that again get paid a lot of money um, to proclaim the new and the AI will be this this fundamental shift and so on and that there will be all sorts of professional jobs so I think lawyer and legal expertise and so on will be effectively kind of almost um, taken out of the hands of, uh, of of people and put into machines and so on and so you will see the the gutting of of once prestigious occupations and so on um, it will have a part uh, whether it will be quite as fundamental again as um, as, as has been predicted it's uh, tricky to know 
at this stage. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my uh, well, actually, before I stop sharing my screen, um, I just wanted to flag a couple of things that are coming up. Um, so we've got two, uh, uh, another couple of kind of uh, alumni events. The next one uh, is with Dr. Dr. Andrea Bernardi, uh, Friday the 10th of March. Um, if you'd like to sign up, you can sign up on the Brooks alumni web pages. Um, I've put the QR code in there. It might work if you quickly hover your phone over it and you can take you to the to the sign up page for that one. Um, and um, the next one is also an alumni event in a few weeks time. Um, I have unhelpfully not included the date. Um, so Crystal, I don't know if you can just put the date in the chat for that one. So that's um, a, a lecture, sustainability, sustainable, food for all, sustainable Food for All from our Dean, Tim Vorley. So that's our annual alumni sustainability lecture uh, there. And again, that details can be found on the Brooks alumni web pages as well. So, and there are some references as well, just to show that I wasn't making it all up. Um, so I'm going to stop, stop sharing my screen now uh, so I can see you all. Um, so, um, Thanks, Crystal. So yeah, the uh, alumni lecture, 29th of March, uh, 6 till 8 p.m. So that's an in-person uh, lecture, um, but I presume there's a way of attending virtually as well. Um, but all the details are on the web pages as well. Um, so um, we've got a little bit of time if anyone has any kind of burning questions or observations or thoughts on any of the things that, that I talked about. As I said, um, I hope you didn't come thinking I was going to explain exactly what's going on in the, the world of work and employment and come to some sort of definitive conclusions, um, rather throw up some, some, some food for thought, I think was my, my principal intention. Um, so, uh, um, Uh, just picking up on, on Heather's, uh, Heather's comment in the chat, I've been pondering something feminist organisational theory always points to the prevalence of the ideal work as the reason that work intensification persists. Do you think quiet quitting the great resignation is a real challenge to this ideology? Um, yeah, that, that's, that's very interesting. I'm, I mean, I'll, be, I'll be, be perfectly honest, I'm not fully aware of the, the, the particular theory or a particular kind of body of theory that, that that's being referred to then but I think it does throw up a particular challenge in, on the kind of wider point about the ideal worker I think I think you're right in the sense that there's the potential for it to um, and that the 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 idea of the kind of fundamental basis of lots of kind of HM theory at least is that workers can be bought uh, and that goes back obviously over a century to the idea of, of um, you know, ideas of scientific management and so on and the fact that uh, that effort can be um, effort can be bought with the right mix of benefits and and what have you um, uh, and so on and if that sort of edifice is slightly crumbling and that people are actually seeing the the, the sort of slightly dismissing that idea and then actually there is at least going to be some pushback on employers to actually change the nature and the construction of jobs and the idea of work and, and how that's experienced by individuals. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really interesting point, Heather. I think that that there is the potential for some of these things to, to, to shift the dial or at least give pause for thought for some of the organisational practice and some of the HR theory that, that tends to underpin uh, lots of organisational practice at the moment. If workers are slightly less, slightly more reluctant to, to commit themselves in the way that, that employers expect them to. Okay, I think so. Uh, one last opportunity if anyone has any uh, questions or thoughts, um, and, and if not, then we'll, we'll draw things to a close. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. Um, I hope. Some of that was interesting, uh, perhaps thought thought provoking. Um, I think there's lots of interesting stuff going on uh, and so on. I think arguably we're always right to be quite skeptical uh, about um, 
uh, skeptical about some of these 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 proclamations of the new and the different and so on, but also remain open minded about the potential for such a seismic event as the the pandemic to have really fundamentally shifted you know our views of 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 different things um uh, whether it's work whether it's our personal lives our relationships and so on and so on so so and of course you know it's management's job to to see well how can we accommodate that and how we can respond um so thank you very much indeed um I hopefully i will see you uh if not in other capacities but at the next alumni event so the next one as i say is on the a uh, similar kind of HRM theme, um, looking at something which is hugely topical right now, the industrial relations, climate and the future of reunionism with, uh, with Andrea. So that's on the 10th of March, again online. So hopefully I'll see you then. Thank you very much for, for coming along. <laughs>